Can I welcome everyone to the 14th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018, and can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. We have received apologies from Joanne Lamont, and I welcome Kezia Dugdale to the committee as a substitute member. The first item of business is an opportunity for, opportunity for Kezia to declare any relevant interest. No Kezia. relevant interest, Chair. Thank you very much. The next item of business is an evidence session on the attainment and achievement of school-aged children experiencing poverty inquiry. This is the fourth evidence session on this inquiry, and this week we have two panels. The first panel has a focus on services provided outside of schools. Can I welcome to this meeting Martin Canavan, Policy and Participation Officer, uh, Aberlour Childcare Trust, Sheila Young, Director of Scotland, Home Start UK, Jackie Howe, Lead Officer, Learning Link Scotland, Graham Young, Head of National Activity Centre, Scout Scotland, and Susan Hunter, Senior Development Officer, Policy and Research, Youth Link Scotland. I should say to the panel from the outset that if you would like to respond to a question, please indicate to me or the clerks, and I will call you to speak. For the benefit of those watching, I should explain that the committee held an informal meeting with frontline professionals on this topic earlier this morning. Can I thank all those who attended the session, some of who are in the audience watching this formal session? We have a lot to get through today, so I ask that both questions and answers today be succinct. And before I invite questions from my colleagues, I would like to ask the panel about early intervention. In the context of supporting our families and low incomes, what does early intervention look like for your organisations, and how does it support attainment and achievement? Um, well, as you probably know, Home Start focuses primarily on 0 to 8. Most Home Starts actually uh, before birth to 5. Um, and I think I'd refer back to the government's own national parenting strategy from 2012, which, which I quote from research says, parents are the biggest single influence on a child's educational aspirations and attainment throughout life. And there's multiple evidence that working with families directly in order to enable their children to get everything they need in terms of their social, emotional and behavioural development is the key to tackling the attainment challenge. So it's not that we don't think there should be work done with school-aged children, but it's quite clear that parents and the home learning environment is incredibly important right from birth and throughout a child's school career. So for us, our work is focused on those early years, focused on working with parents on a one-to-one -one basis primarily, although, so, although we also run group work, to make sure that parents are able to do what they need to do with their children to create that positive home learning environment. And there's nothing new in this. I mean, I think the Marmot Review in 2011 said that families rather than schools have the greatest influence. So our work really is designed for that. OK, thank you. Jack? I'd just like to add that um, parents are much more likely to get involved in their children's education at the early years. And I think if you can capture them within, with their children's education, but also for themselves, then they're more likely to stay with the educational process throughout that duration. OK. Martin and then Susan. Um, uh, Aberlour, we support families um, uh, for a uh, number of reasons. We offer holistic needs-led family support. Uh, we work with children, young people and their families, often this is as a result of parental substance misuse, um, parental mental health concerns, uh, domestic abuse, parent, uh, parental learning disability or sometimes a combination of, of any of those. We do a lot of work um, in early years and I'd like to echo the comments about how important it is supporting families in the early years. We recognise that uh, parents are often the first um, and main educators of their children um, and therefore in addressing attainment um, the the, the, the need for ensuring we have robust, uh, holistic family support right at the early stage of a, a child's life and, and throughout that early stage journey, making sure they're school ready is really, really key. Uh, we'd just like to add Youth Link Scotland, we're a membership organisation of uh, national, regional and local authority youth services. Um, the early intervention doesn't have to mean the early years um, and that there are always opportunities to intervene at times when professionals, practitioners, volunteers recognise that something's changing in the lives of a young person and knowing how they can best support that young person in negotiation with the young person themselves. Um, and the, the youth work um, is well placed to offer alternatives for young people to learn where formal education might not work best for them. We have to recognise that 85% of a young person's learning happens outside the classroom. It's not to say that that happens within youth work all the time, but youth work has, has a place to play. And we work um, with nearly 400,000 young people every week in Scotland are accessing youth work opportunities. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, so just to kind of echo that really, um, Scout Scotland is obviously a voluntary-led organisation and we work with 
in Scotland, 40,000 young people, and we do it through um, the help of 11,000 volunteers. So for us, um, early intervention is often about access and ensuring, particularly in some of the communities that this, uh, this panel is focusing on, um, that first of all, we're able to get the provision up and running, um, and secondly, um, that we're able to, our, our young people are able to access it. Uh, we've got an evidence-based program um, uh, we've evidenced impact along different areas of that programme. Um, so for us, uh, early intervention is really about access. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I go on to uh, George, I, I appreciate everybody, I did ask for everybody to answer there, but don't feel that you have to answer every question, just answer if, if you think it's relevant to you. George. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. I would just like to carry on from where the convener left off with uh, early intervention and uh, family support. And one of the one of the things that Nancy Clooney, the head teacher from Delmarnock, brought out last week was the fact that she uh, she created the community. She went out proactively and created. You didn't have a parent council, uh, but created the community. And she said that if you need you need happy families to get happy children. And uh, she saw that there was a life out with the school gates that she had to be part of. Now, my question would be, do you think it's something that that kind of leadership is what most schools need? And does the school need to be the one that leads it? Or that, can it be led by someone out in the community working with the school? You know, does it have to be the same all over? Or do, is there other ways we can do that? Um, I really think there's a room for both. I think the really important point that was made by in the informal <coughs> session actually by one of our volunteers is that a lot of parents have had negative experiences of school mm -hmm. themselves. So professionals, uh, even the great community inclusive ones like Nancy, have a really tough hill to climb in terms of reaching some families. Volunteer-led models um, often work very well. It doesn't mean a volunteer couldn't work out of a school, for example. It doesn't have to come in the preschool phase, as Homestart does. But as, as my volunteer this morning said, Anne, um, volunteers are seen as of us. They are us, not them. And she mentioned families flying into a panic as soon as a formal letter arrives, even mm -hmm. if it's a letter offering them help. So I think the stick, when we're talking about poor families especially, poor families are not necessarily poor parents, by the way, but the circumstances they live in um, work to create the sorts of stresses that undermine good parenting, and sometimes they don't have a foundation. And I, to echo that, I think it was a quote from someone from the Violence Reduction Unit, as we know is doing some brilliant work in this area, if, um, if you don't have a good role model sitting across you from the kitchen table, you're already disadvantaged. And I think a lot of parents haven't had that, and they're very suspicious and distrustful of teachers and of professionals. So volunteer-led models are incredibly important. So I would argue that there's space for both. Schools need to get more open, more accessible, more engaging, but they might need to link up more often with organisations that are experienced in supporting volunteers to do that community-level work. Yeah, I just again uh, like to, to, to echo what Sheila said there um, about it being both. Um, certainly partnership, I think, is the key. Uh, Nancy, I think last week in our session, um, illustrated how proactive um, she has been in going out and creating that community, as you mentioned. Um, and I think there's lots of head teachers that we would be able to that would be able to evidence and highlight a kind of similar approach. But I think equally there's also a, a lot of head teachers in schools that maybe aren't quite as proactive. Um, and therefore, um, where there are opportunities for those that are providing services within the community or other key stakeholders to try and be champions for that family support and try to um, make that contact and make those links uh, with schools, um, that needs to be that, the, that needs to be uh, supported. Um, I think the point was made during the, the informal session earlier on this morning is that there actually, as a result, there is a lot of expectation on head teachers in schools at the moment around pupil equity funding and around what um, our assumptions are about what they know, what is ha about what's happening <coughs> in their communities, um, and an expectation that they're going to be able to go out and just find the, the organisations that are providing services to support families. Um, there's a lot of really, really good work going on um, throughout communities throughout the country, um, provided by the third sector, working with families. There are already really good relationships and existing relationships built by those workers, by those services, with those families in those communities. And I think there's a real opportunity for schools to be able to build and develop on the foundations already led, uh, already, uh, already um, laid by, by those organisations, by that work that's going on. And therefore, I think you know, partnership really absolutely has to be the key in how we support schools to, to identify the best family support that's available. Okay, thank you. Liam and Andrew. <coughs> Um, again, just to add on to that, um, I think this committee has talked about procurement um, 
uh, in previous sessions. Um, and I, I don't want to raise a, a kind of a slightly dull process point, but a lot of this is around <coughs> the ability to commission well, good commissioning, a commissioning process, so that for head teachers or other members in the community who uh, are in a position to do so, when they're considering um, the needs that are out there, that they're able to take in all the evidence, um, including research, uh, uh, consultation with parents, consultation with children, most importantly, to make an informed decision uh, on what services are required. Sometimes that might mean purchasing a service, but sometimes that also might mean working in partnership to develop a new service. But also sometimes it's just about better signposting to what's already out there and supporting what's already out there. So there's a process element in all of this as well. Okay, thank you. Jackie? I was just going to um, echo a little bit about what's already said, but the importance of that good partnership work, if you can involve both the community and the schools, then it adds to the, the kind of vibrancy, the creating of a learning culture. So I think although schools are experts in school education, mm -hmm. a number of different organisations around the table and, and elsewhere are, are experts in engagement. So I think uh, collaborative work is the way forward. Ken, can I let there was a couple of small supplementaries wanted to come in? Mary and then all of Very brief. Convener, I have a, a very um, brief supplementary and it's specifically directed um, at, at Martin and it's something that you say in, in your submission, Martin, when you talk about um, literacy and numeracy being prioritised over health and wellbeing in, in raising um, attainment um, and, and you also talk about um, the poverty-related attainment gap and we should focus on all po policy areas, not just um, education. And Harry Burns, in the submission he's given us, um, he talks about um, inter the intergenerational pat pattern of, of, of poverty. And he also mentions the, um, the skills-based curriculum, which produces a, a grad grind pedagogy of poverty. And I'd be interested in whether or not you agree with that analysis by, by Harry, Sir Harry Burns, and how you think we can encourage schools to take that wider look at attainment, not just on the skills that, that, that children have or young people have on their whole wealth and health and wealth being? Yeah. Um, I would absolutely echo and support anything that uh, Harry Burns says because he's far more mm -hmm. qualified than me uh, to comment. Um, I think around understanding and recognising the wider health and wellbeing, or in, in, the, in relation to the point on some schools prioritising literacy and numeracy, mm -hmm. I think it's, a, a, I think it's simple, a, a simple a uh, fact that it's easier to evidence improvements mm -hmm. in literacy and numeracy for schools and therefore it's quite obvious that mm -hmm. it, from an education point of view that would maybe be where schools would feel more comfortable um, in, in, in looking to, uh, to, to seek uh, additional support and also to provide uh, to, 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 to evidence that. Um, I think that uh, we did talk about wider achievement in the informal session earlier on. Um, Tavish had, had, had asked a question of the panel that were there. And I think there's absolutely a place where we need to understand what it is we mean when we're talking about attainment versus achievement. Um, and what achievement in some respects, even though it may not be academic uh, achievement, means for some of the young people, uh, children young people that we, that we work with and, uh, and in our schools. Um, we spoke a little bit about um, some of the uh, kind of anecdotal examples of some of the work that we do in Govan, for example. Um, we were working informally with the school and supporting some of the young people there to um, to access opportunities around kind of practical key transferable skills and the impact that's had on them being able to to remain in school not to be uh, excluded um, and therefore the opportunities that affords them after school even though those child those young people specifically aren't necessarily going to achieve academically um, um, and so I think we we maybe need to have a wider conversation um, partly as a result of, of, of maybe this inquiry. Um, in relation to what we mean by attainment versus achievement and actually what will the achievement of some of those young people be um, in terms of their contribution to their communities even though they necessarily haven't attained academically if there are wider achievement mm -hmm. opportunities in schools. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Oliver. Thank you. Uh, convener, I should state, although it's not a formal uh, declaration of interest, that I'm a Cub Scout leader in Dumfrieshire. Um, the the thing I wanted to go back to was the, the points you were raising around commissioning of services and buying in services in schools. Um, in the informal session, there was a sort of suggestion that there's huge variation across Scotland in terms of uh, what head teachers are aware of uh, and also uh, what's being offered in different schools. Um, if you 
agree with that? What, what do you think we do about it? And uh, how do we go about replicating good practice? Um, thanks for that, that question. I think this is an issue that, that you think are hearing um, increasingly from our members around how do they how are they known by head teachers? So um, previously, you know, before, before PEF, um, particularly large national youth organisations would have um, built relationships with the local authority. They would have got potentially an endorsement. They may have um, agreed a match funding arrangement of um, charitable funds with local authority funds. And then the school may have contributed some monies as well once they wanted to, to have that service or programme within their school. That landscape has completely changed with PEF. So now... Um, youth organisations are having to have that dialogue with individual head teachers. Now, um, exactly the point that Graeme made, head teachers um, are now asking them to be effectively business managers on how do they utilise um, this resource. Um, and one of the, the, the um, feedback we've had directly from head teachers is that they feel that third sector organisations are, are marketing, they're on a sales pitch, whereas actually what third sector organisations want to be is collaborative partners. They want to make impact on learners' lives. They, they want to um, improve experiences of education for young people. So they actually have a shared goal. This is not actually about the money. This is about creating impact and change um, and improving outcomes for young people. And there needs to be greater involvement of um, third sector um, and other um, and statutory youth work providers um, at the planning stage, at the identification of the need um, through school improvement planning, through, um, through addressing um, and coming up with some, something jointly involving children, young people, involving parents, what exactly collaboration is meant to be. It's not, collaboration is not the purchase of a service. Collaboration is about the, the shaping of a programme that will lead to improved outcomes for learners. If, if anybody else has come in, can you come in very briefly, please, because it's just a supplementary and George is coming back in. I just wanted to say we run a programme called Big Hopes, Big Futures, which is about reaching children just before school to boost their ability to um, flourish in school, um, mainly working with children identified by school are likely to be at risk. Um, working through, we've got national level funding for some of the architecture around that, but working at local levels, I just want to echo what you just said, that it's really difficult working with individual schools because of the timescales that they work on and their capacity to get something started alongside our capacity and having to talk to quite so many different people. And that is going to limit both the rollout of that and the reach of that, but also actually limit the evaluability of it. How do we evaluate something when it's happening in, it, rather sporadically? And I think that's a real problem. Okay. Just, just very quickly, I think there's an opportunity for the regional improvement collaboratives to um, invite the third sector into their, into their meetings, into their pro projects, into their planning. And that could be one way where the schools engage with third sector. OK, thank you. George? Just to follow on from what Sheila Young said earlier on to my question and probably follow on from what Jackie Howie said as well, was the fact that Nan Nancy Clooney last week kept talking about uh, uh, our teachers, she had to get them to change their attitude. You know, they, they had to work a different way. And she wasn't blaming her staff. She was just saying that, you know, there was different ways of, different ways of dealing with things and she had to do that. So is it not a case that I, I, I've been involved in, uh, well, as a time as a councillor and my time here, I know there's great work happening with the third sector throughout the country. How do we find a way to get this to actually marry up with the, uh, the organisations? I know Jackie made a suggestion there as well. But how do we get the third sector to be working with the, uh, the, the local authorities and the uh, schools and to make sure we get over this kind of attitude of the school gate, that's where it all stops. Uh, Jackie, sorry, can, uh, can I bring in Jackie first, please? I was just going to say, um, I think there's a real um, bonus for cross-sectoral uh, professional learning. I think that um, if you can invite uh, third sector, local authority sector, um, even college sector in to look at specific issues, perhaps, perhaps around STEM, that's a big area where there's a, a lack of familiarity and lo knowledge across the sectors. But the cross-collaborative um, professional learning can build trust, build awareness and understanding. I just want to say it's really important to recognise that yeah, some schools put extra pressures on families, albeit unintentionally. There's probably there's 31 home starts in Scotland. I doubt there's a single one that hasn't been working with a family who has 
experience the school, for example, requesting money for you know, the cost of the school day stuff for activities, or perhaps excluding a child for poor behaviour uh, rather than working with that child. And that is an issue, and we do want to work more closely with schools. Homestart Glasgow South, for example, runs creative play sessions inside the school during the school day or immediately after the school day, which involves parents, but also teachers drop in and see that, that type of work. And I do actually feel that teachers have such a tough job. Not everything can be dealt with in school, but they're not necessarily trained to deal creatively with the kind of social, emotional, behavioural difficulties that some of these children who are way behind the curve experience. Of course, that's why we'll always argue for better quality family support before children reach school, but absolutely, Home Starts and other organisations need to be working across that barrier and I think being in school is a great thing. I'd also say my children were lucky enough to go to a primary school that um, actually was a bit low, below capacity and a free classroom was given over as a drop-in space for parents. That made that school instantly a more welcoming place for parents to hang around, to get to know the school staff a little better than you can and two parents' evenings a year. I, as a parent, albeit educated very well and all the rest of it, found schools very intimidating places, actually. And we've heard from a volunteer this morning about how parents feel. So there's something about making schools more open, which I think has been made more difficult with, with more stringent child protection, to be honest. The primary school my, my children went to in Scotland, I was physically locked out of the building. I never went inside except for parents' evenings. That's not a great way of breaking down those barriers. Thank you, Susan. You wanted to come in. I think just in, in direct response to George around what... Um, we could we could be doing is is actually around not othering the third sector and other education practitioners and actually you know that youth work doesn't exist to support schools youth work exists as its own professional entity and i think you know how that is presented in leadership whether that's from yourselves as parliamentarians or through um, government officials and in, in policy that we talk about all professionals who want to make an impact on young people's learning, that education is not just school. So you know, recent do documents talk about teachers and other professionals, teachers and other educators. So that automatically creates a divide. And actually, we're all in this together. We all want to improve the lives of young people. Um, and just maybe ch a change to the rhetoric um, would help break down some of those barriers. OK, George. Yep. Right, OK, I'm going to move on, Martin. You can come in later on. Uh, Ross. Convener, um, I'd like to come back to... Um, Sheila, you, your submission made uh, some very powerful points around the, the benefits of early years, early intervention, taking on board the points being made that not all early intervention is in the early years. Um, I'm wondering what the impact of the Pupil Equity Fund has been around that. Um, directing funding through schools is obviously at the stage past early years. What impact has that had so far that you've seen on the success of intervention in early years? Has it had a cascade effect and, and strengthened it, or has it perhaps moved focus further up? Um, I think it's too early to say, but I can give you some examples of where it's not been helpful. We have had schools tell us they're not allowed to spend money with organisations that are providing support pre the school age start, which is apparently not the case, but that's what they've been told by their local authority, so they say. We've had schools that have wanted to join together in a cluster so that in a, in a you know, we've got place-based funding, so we would like to deliver place-based work. Um, I've been told by their local authorities that that now has breached tendering um, uh, limits, and so they will have to go to a full tendering process. I've also been told that that shouldn't have happened, but it has happened. So what I think the most obvious and immediate impact is, is that though we're very proud of having 31 local home starts embedded in their local communities who all do work slightly different ways themselves, we don't really want to have to find out what the micro rules are in every area in order to be able to work effectively with a cluster of schools. And frankly, we do. As I said, in Glasgow South, we work with one school doing creative play. That came before PEF money, actually. Um, we're perfectly happy to do that when it's feasible. But when you're talking about specially training a member of staff to run a specially trained group of volunteers to do a particular kind of intervention. It's not very cost effective to do it for four children in one school and three children in, you know, sort of two towns away. That's not really a, a, a viable way of going ahead. So we think at the moment the likely outcome is a kind of sort of greater fragmentation and atomization of effort. And as I said earlier, therefore limiting the ability to evaluate. And that is so important. Um, we have to show what works. 
Can, you, can I, uh, yeah. well, you're going to come back in on that? Can I just come back in on that? You're saying that there's, there'd be an atomisation of the services, but there wouldn't be if, if... Correct me if I'm wrong here, but there wouldn't be if the local authorities were given the right information about how they could spend the PEF money. Um, I, it, it could still happen because obviously it's at a head's discretion and a yeah, head is only going to commission what they know It doesn't have about. to happen as a point I'm making. No, it doesn't have to happen. Yeah, OK, thank you for that. Oh, sorry. Um, on, continue with this, but on, on the wider point of... Um, if the goal of the Pupil Active Fund is early, not always early intervention, but if we're talking from the prism of early intervention here, if the goal is early intervention to close the attainment gap um, and you have a funding model, um, I'd be interested in your thoughts representing the third sector on um, is a funding model that works exclusively through schools the best model or would more direct models that involve yourselves rather than the issues that have been highlighted of having to go through individual schools? What, what model would you like to have, have seen? Martin, first then, um, I think that the picture around the, the funding model for PEF has presented us with a fairly inconsistent picture across the country. I think, as evidenced in earlier sessions and some of what's already been discussed this morning, um, where there are good relationships with schools, where um, head teachers are quite proactive and understand about issues that are happening before and beyond the school gates, that PEF is a really, really good model where those existing relationships and community relationships are already in place. I think that um, where, the, as we've already mentioned, I think as I've already mentioned, where there is a, a need to support teachers, to support schools more to recognise what's happening, then PEF doesn't necessarily present or provide the best model because it could result in money being spent on things that maybe don't work, aren't evidence to work. Um, and uh, what is essentially a very valuable resource um, could be otherwise um, not, not used as best it could be. Um, one example I would use um, would be the experience we have in one local authority, and I'm, going to be, I'm, I'm not going to be specific here, um, but just to raise it as a concern, I suppose, around where PEF is being used, is that it's been used in some schools, we understand, to bring in campus police officers, for example. Um, and we're not entirely convinced uh, as an organisation in terms of the work that we do and the young people we work with and the needs of the young people that we work with that campus police officers are a particular good use of PEF funding. Um, that's not to say there isn't a role for police in schools. That's not to say there isn't a role for excellent focused programmes of work provided by police in schools around things like antisocial behaviour. But when it's uniformed police, uh, campus police officers patrolling school campuses, we're not entirely sure that's, a, that's a, an appropriate use of, of, of PEF funding. Um, but what we're seeing there is the schools that have decided locally to, to, to take that approach and to use PEF for that purpose uh, is highlighting the inconsistency where we've already heard this morning in the informal session, some local authorities are locally, some schools are taking a very prescriptive approach to how they spend that money focused specifically on individual children. Whereas in one school, um, where, 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 in some schools, sorry, where, where police are being brought in um, to provide campus police officers, there's a much more general approach that this will be for the well-being of the school, as misplaced as we believe that understanding of well-being is, that it's for the well-being of the school generally and not for a specific group or individual children. So I think that kind of highlights that there's a real inconsistency around how PEF, the understanding of PEF is being interpreted and applied and used by different schools and actually where it does work well, where teachers are engaged and supported to, to use the money to the best, uh, for the best, uh, in the best way they can, that's evidence to work, that's excellent, but maybe there needs to be a more guidance, either through the Scottish Government, local authorities, to ensure that money is being spent appropriately. Can I just come in at this point, if you don't mind? The, the, uh, we've just been told that the local authorities are involving themselves too much and giving out wrong information, and you're saying that maybe they should get involved more maybe because the guidance, you don't like the way that some schools are spending the money? Wherever that's coming from, wherever if it's coming from the Scottish Government, who've provided the national operational guidance, and actually the operational guidance, as uh, Sheila's already mentioned, um, says one thing, and maybe some of the schools you're working with have, have interpreted it a, a different way. Um, it, it does need to be flexible, and the whole point about PEF is that it's providing autonomy to head teachers so that they can recognise and understand locally what needs are and spend their PEF allocation appropriately. But what we maybe have already evidenced this morning is that maybe not all head teachers are best placed to make that decision because of any number of reasons. Maybe they don't understand what's happening in their communities as best or as other teachers. Or not in the way that, that, that certain groups like. 
it sounds very mercenary to say that it's not being spent in the way that the third sector would like it to be spent. But what I think, most people I think sitting around this table would agree that maybe camp, uniformed campus police officers are not the best use of PEF. I'm, I'm not going to put it to a vote. There's a, good re there's a good reason why campus police are in some schools and not in others. So, and I think that that could benefit the education system. Very quickly. Sorry, Ross, this is still your gig. Sorry, my apologies. Sorry, Ross. Just, just a brief comment. I wouldn't want folk to have the impression that campus police officers, community police officers are patrolling schools in a somewhat... Um, I, I think there's maybe a bit of a misunderstanding about what they're doing when they're in there, and, and I think we'd, we'd probably want to be careful. There's, there's a lot of good work that goes on. Yeah. The work's happening in communities, and there's absolutely a role for, for community police in schools. But we think that, our feed, from what young people, specifically young people we work with, have told us, where some of those police are um, being funded to provide services in schools through PEF, that that's not necessarily going to impact positively on their education, specifically let's, those that are on the fringes on. of education. Ross, yeah, you get in. Uh, well, I think the other panellists wanted to respond to the original question. <laughs> Which was some we've, time we've ago. We've moved far. <laughs> uh, Susan. Yeah, um, so you were, you were asking about where might PEF not be the best fit for, for teachers. I think um, the, the point made earlier about PEF can work for literacy and numeracy programmes. When it comes to health and wellbeing programmes, I think it becomes much more challenging. And this is where schools may want to pull resources together. We heard examples of um, a cluster of schools wanting to purchase a counselling service and, again, reach, reach some um, procurement threshold. So the whole, the whole process was kibosh. But one of the areas which we are particularly interested in is around the provision of summer programmes. And it may be that the school wants to purchase one or two places for specific young people with identified needs. And that's where national youth organisations um, can make that provision. But it's very, very difficult for them to, um, to do that through PEF. So actually, there's, there needs to be still space for for national funding um, that national organisations can, can bid in for um, directly from government, but still meets local need. And I think there's a disconnect currently around national, um, the understanding that national um, organisations actually do provide local services. Um, and that, that disconnect there, so um, it's just an, it's an anomaly as well. Briefly, sure to say something about um, the pattern of funding, which can be very short term. So uh, as I sit here at the moment, over half our network is on one year funding deals. And over 15% of them don't even know what funding they're going to get for this current financial year that's already started. So working in partnership with schools or anybody else on a basis that makes sense is made very difficult when you're in that uncertain funding. So it's just to re-echo really that point about national level funding being a backbone that helps local work happen really, really well. Okay, thank you. And I've got one brief question about poverty proofing, convener. Okay, you were going to ask a question about scouts as well. Yes, that's you? the poverty proofing. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, thanks. Good. Uh, Graham, interested. We've we've discussed um, poverty proofing in schools quite a lot um, as a committee, and had some really compelling evidence about it. It's been mentioned this morning. Uh, the scouts, I suppose, are. I would imagine quite a good example of a third sector organisation involving large numbers of young people. I I'm wondering what steps you take to poverty-proof your service within the context of being a largely volunteer-led service relying on various funding sources. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so over the last few years we've been uh, working a lot on trying to evidence impact. Um, uh, we, as an organisation, um, we, we try and be as inclusive as possible and we work to try and reflect the communities that we, that we uh, and you know we deliver our, our service in um, and through that learning um, we feel like we're developing a, a model which is able to uh, develop provision particularly in areas of deprivation or harder to reach communities but also rural deprivation as well um, and uh, I have evidence um, uh, around that as well in Scotland it takes the form of local development officers which target specific areas I think our issue more is that uh, we know the model works, um, but we can't create enough provision quickly enough. So we have about 4,000 young people on waiting lists, and those are in areas where there's already provision. Um, so uh, where we are at as an organisation is really looking for opportunities to fund the model that we know works. It's also um, a model that's very cost effective. Um, as you know, we deliver most of what we deliver through volunteers. So from a public purse point of view, that has its benefits. Um, it also has its benefits because it's often a sustainable model as well. Um, so for example, we know that £550 
will uh, deliver a place for a young person that will last four years, potentially longer. Um, and again, against some other uh, services out there, we think that's good value for money. Um, just another point I wanted to, to raise as well is um, the attainment gap is, uh, has been described as an experience gap. Um, and as a universal service out there, one of the things that the Scout programme does is it provides its young people with a, a wealth of experiences which actually mirror to a certain extent curriculum for excellence. Um, so there's real benefits in getting that programme into areas of deprivation. And when we've talked to our young people, we do surveys with our young people every year, um, what they're telling us is that they're not getting enough opportunities for extracurricular activities or informal education. But what's really interesting about that data is, is young people on preschool meals who are saying more than um, their counterparts not on preschool meals that we are not getting access um, to the uh, extracurricular activities that are out there. So young people in areas of deprivation know they're not getting um, the access that is out there. And I think that's a really interesting um, a, a really interesting point to make. So for us, it's about we've got a model we know works, um, but we just can't get it into the uh, communities quickly enough, I suppose, and, and that's where we're, we're at, really, as an organisation. So, yeah. Thank you. Briefly, Susan. Yeah, just to say the you know, youth work, um, in, which obviously includes Scouts, is very much the principle is about inclusion as one of our core values. Um, so to poverty proof is, is almost in the heart of every youth work organisation and as much as possible they would want to provide services are free at the point of access. Um, and that includes providing young people with experiences to travel overseas, if that's funded through Erasmus or, or other funds where there is actually no cost directly associated to the young person. Um, and also, you know, we, we've got examples of, of summer programmes where young people are um, being fed, taking swimming, so they can have a shower, um, provision of personal hygiene products, all of these things which create a, a, a zero cost experience, um, but a positive and a high quality experience for young people. Thank you. No, I'm, going, I'm going to move on, Graham. Uh, I'm going to move on. Yeah, uh, when you're coming back in with something else, you can bring it in. Tavish. Thank you, Gavina achievement which we discussed um, uh, earlier on and it, kind of, it absolutely relates to, to uh, Graham and Susan's points. Uh, national policy is attainment, not achievement. Discuss. <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> yes, Susan. Um, Nas national policy um, does include achievement if you look at curriculum for excellence. Curriculum for excellence at its heart is everything that education should be for young people, about personalisation, about choice, around personal achievement. All of that language is in there in Curriculum for Excellence, but there has been this slide towards attainment. And our concern is that what gets measured gets done. And, and that's a real difficult place to be because we actually know that for many young people, achievement is about their sense of self, their self-worth, their contribution, their confidence. Uh, nothing to add to. I mean, that says it all, really. Yeah. Um, maybe. Well, sorry. One. One thing to add. <laughs> you're, um, you're a politician. <laughs> <as well. laughs> yeah. But also, if you listen to young people themselves, um, they're also saying um, that for them, achievement uh, is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and there's something around choice, um, and that's often the, the kind of the, the gold dust around what will end up leading to attainment. So it's, the, uh, it's young people choosing themselves and being motivated themselves around a certain area, whether it be outdoor learning, STEM, you know, there's a plethora. Um, and, and that's what I think education ultimately is to capture. And I just wanted to make one other quick point. When I mentioned the £550 earlier on, that was to create a place. Scouting's free. Um, there's a, a slight membership charge, but that would never come in the way of... of of any child accessing it, um, so just to, to make that point. Okay. I would just very briefly make the point that, you know, ultimately, what is our, our ambition for our children and young people? Do we want them to grow up to be happy, healthy, contributing members of our community? I would say yes, we probably all do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if that means that some of them will achieve academically, that's fantastic. But if those are if others are achieving in a wider sense, but still managing to move on, to grow up, to contribute as members of the community, to do the things that make them happy um, and healthy individuals, then I think achievement needs to be considered as important as, as a team. Okay. And therefore, um, no, thank you for that. And therefore, uh, 
given the pressures we place on schools, and we're just potentially about to place even more pressures on schools with head teachers' charters and so on and so forth, uh, teachers are under enormous pressure to achieve attainment, not necessarily achievement. How, how would you like to see that rebalanced, or is there, is there some uh, what development of policy you'd like to see in this area? Sure. Um, I can say what I wouldn't want to see, is I wouldn't want to see a notion that we have some twin track. Yeah. So children who enter school behind the curve go down some sort of vocational route, and that's what we accept as achievement. Sure. Um, what I would like to see is, is uh, I said, this sounds ridiculous, but more like an education that I benefited from, where things that were um, non-academic were rated within the school just as highly. Mm -hmm. So sport, for example. Someone was talking today, uh, this morning, in the informal session about the cost of the school day. Well, um, I happen to know from first-hand experience how expensive it is to support a young person who wants to achieve in sport to a reasonably high level. And you see dropouts all the time from children who come from poorer backgrounds because their parents can't ship them around, they can't pay for physio, they can't do this, they can't do that. Um, schools can be a huge place for that to happen, um, but also that reflects back into academic achievement often. When people feel they're doing well in one area, they start to do better in others. So it's really important also to remember that there were a lot of young parents, people who might actually be in education but are actually have become parents at an early age, they get a huge sense of achievement when they get their parenting right. So uh, schools that are discouraging of young people to come back if they have had a child while they're still at school age, they've just got to end. You know, it, we've got to make sure that education is back to more of a lifelong thing, that people can dip in and dip out when their life allows them to do it, and that they're welcomed. Now, I think there is too much pressure on school, but then I think there's almost too much pressure on every organisation that's trying to provide for people who are struggling at the moment. So my view would be that it can't all happen in school. It has to happen as a mix between in and out of school provision. Um, the third sector has a big role to play in that. Um, but I also think that we have to recognise as a society, I mentioned this morning how so many families that we support come back and become volunteers for Homestar. That's a huge achievement for them, a massive achievement. You know, people are on a lifelong journey. Not everything has to happen in school, but where that journey starts well, which is with the parents, it's likely to end well. And I think that's the important thing to see as a continuum, not just what happens in school. Okay. Can I have one final question, Kavina? Um, the Anderson High School in Lowe, it's got 900 kids, and we've got now one full-time youth officer worker in that school staff setup. Is that a broadly, is that an experience you see across Scotland? Uh, are there enough youth workers as part of school uh, teams across Scotland? Uh, I think there is um, pr probably a growing picture of, of that happening, particularly local authority youth work staffs being aligned to schools. Um, I think there's still some challenges around what the role of that youth worker is. Um, for some, they are seen very much as part of the school staff team. Um, for others, they are still staff coming into the school. Mm. So there, there's still a journey to go on, but there is definitely emerging practice that's, that's really outstanding. Obviously, um, the work in Shetland, um, Aberdeen um, City have, and Aberdeenshire have really, really fantastic youth work and schools provision. Mm. Um, so it's, it's looking at maybe bringing um, some spotlight and some evidence around the impact of that, how teachers feel about having youth worker in their school, um, the value it brings to young people's wellbeing, um, experience of pupils, of parents. I think there needs to be greater study around, around the impact of that. But certainly one, one youth worker for 900 pupils is not going to go no, far. Um, and, and also remembering Quite that youth work is, is an offer for, for every young person. Um, and we had a, a, one of our members' networks was a a youth worker had said, says, I used to go into school with the project, with the idea, and it was open to every young person. I now go into the school and I'm given the group of young mm. people. And it is very hard, youth work is a voluntary activity, young people choose to be part of a youth work experience. And that might be to, in, to improve outcomes for them, and there, there may need to be that nurture and that referral, but it's about a relationship and it's about a choice. Um, so that those principles and values need to remain, need to remain there. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ruth, you had a brief supplementary and then was. Thank you, Convener. I, I just wanted to ask um, Graeme Young, just on a practical level, for a uniformed organisation, even buying a uniform is a barrier. If there are trips away, having suitable rucksack or suitcase to go, so even if you're funding trips and doing things, so how, on a practical level, do you encourage families for whom that might be a barrier to, to have those experiences? <clears throat> um, uniform is never a barrier. So um, 
if it's if it's something that doesn't work in that local setting, then um, there's there's different ways around it. It might just be that they wear an icky instead, um, and an icky might be something that uh, they receive when they come through the door. Okay. So um, in terms of the uniform, there's no stigmatisation. Um, in terms of uh, going away on trips uh, and you know those outdoor adventure experiences, which are core to the Scout program, um, again we. Uh, run a, a, a grant fund centrally um, and that can be for individual groups um, it's also for groups who are starting so we, we make it able for them to to go away and um, this year we're actually going to be introducing a travel fund as well because travel um, is one of the the costs that our, our members are are telling us is one of the, one of the barriers for them to go away um, but also there's there's, uh, and this is maybe a wider point with uh, looking at, we've talked about the P7 residential quite a lot uh, over the last little while. You can go away and, and it'd be a, a much cheaper experience for a parent and carer. So for example, with Scouts it is a good example. We will often camp uh, in tents. Now camping in tents can cost as little as five pounds at a campsite. Um, in terms of the equipment required, we have stores of equipment that we'll make accessible. In terms of the skills required to set up a camp, we can train uh, our volunteers, parents, we train teachers. Um, so making those kind of experiences accessible is actually probably one of, one of our strengths as an organisation, and it's never a barrier, particularly in areas of deprivation. Um, but I think schools could learn quite a lot from the way that we would manage, uh, particularly the outdoor experience. You can also just go down to your local park. Do you know, there's different ways of doing it. Sure, thank you. OK, thank you very much, Liz. Yes, Convener, can I pose what's a difficult question, but I think it's an important one, in that I would argue very strongly that some of the best educational experiences that anybody can have are nothing to do with exams. They're outside uh, the classroom. Uh, yet it's very hard to measure that. It's hard to define it, actually, never mind measure it. Uh, but you've spoken uh, volumes this morning, both in private session and in the formal session, about the worth that that is, especially to youngsters who might not feel that they are very valued. And I just wonder if you feel that we have to do more uh, to recognise these achievements, um, and whether you think awards and certificates can help to do that. Um, and I cite the example that we have at the moment, that the committee is grappling with it, there has been a, a big national debate about uh, national fours against national fives, and that national fours are not particularly well recognised because there's no exam at the end of it. And it's all part of this thing. How, how do we reward these youngsters who have achieved, in some cases, extremely well? Might be low level, but that's very important to them. How do you feel that we should be rewarding? Susan. Um, I, I I think the most important thing is that a young person is able to articulate what they have achieved. Whether or not they are given a certificate or, or any other means, the most important thing is that the young person could tell somebody else, I can now do this. I have had this experience and as a result, I now have this skill, I now have this knowledge, and I have this confidence. So that is really, really important, is about the people to articulate, because that's what employers want. An employer wants somebody who can say, yeah, I can do this and I can show you how I can do it. So. There's a bit of a, a process, I think, with um, with, a, the, with, the, with employers, with um, further and higher education of how can you, how do you measure, how do you value beyond the certification? Youth awards are very, very valuable at helping give young people those milestones for them to remember what they have achieved, and and I think that's a really important way of using youth awards so that when a young person um, over their, their learning journey can look back and say, oh yeah, I did that in my Youth Achievement Award. This was my challenge. We went camping and these are the skills I worked. I worked as a team. I worked with the people. I set up a camp. I cooked food. And, and it's, it's using them as, as, a, as an aid for helping young people acknowledge and recognise their skills. But, just on, on, on pursuing that point, mm. do you feel that we have to do more with employers who at bottom level are often looking for your grades and your exams, um, particularly in a highly competitive world. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do to persuade them that actually a lot of the skills that are not related to uh, academic attainment are as important in the world of work than those which are achieved in the classroom? 
I think there was a, I think it was a CBI report which actually described all the skills that employers were mm -hmm. looking for, and, and as the youth work sector, we said, well, that, that's what youth work does. So I don't think we should push all employers into the space of they just want to look for qualifications. But I do think there needs to be the, the landscape of learning journeys is, is really, really variable now. And there's not just the you go to school, you go to college, you go to uni, and Bob's uncle, you're somebody that's that's employable. There's there's much more diversity in that. And I think that's just going to take time. It's, it's a societal change of people recognising that there are multiple routes to learning and to achievement. Uh, Sheila wants to come in and then kick I, the I, I think there's two very positive examples. I worked for Standard Life for a time, which took up the challenge posed by the Edinburgh Guarantee and brought in young people without classic qualifications and did some of that sort of pastoral support as part of their learning inside the workplace. And I think those kinds of interventions of brilliance um, so there was no award scheme attached to that, but it was an employer recognising the benefits of doing that. Um, also, I'm very interested in the way that the um, uh, Tigers organisation, which is an effectively an apprenticeship middle agency, um, has picked up on the fact that the apprentices that they've been working with often drop out of work, even though they've had all the right training. Um, and they've picked up on the work of Suzanne, Suzanne Zedeik and the whole Adverse Childhood Experiences ACES agenda, because they've recognised that those young people are, are, are suffering from experiences earlier on, which they've not had adequate support to, to work their way through. And I think that's an incredibly positive development, because that message is going to get to more employers as a result of an organisation like that taking it on, rather other than just us who, who focus on the early years. But I'd like to say something about uh, um, uh, the Growing Up in Scotland study. The data drawn from that has shown that 11% of children are known to have social, no emotional and behavioural problems. Uh, that's 94,000 children in Scotland. Now, because we know that, we also can know um, when that situation changes. And generally speaking, those children with those kind of challenges change dramatically, not because of an external award or certificate, but because of an adult they have a relationship who they respect and care about says something good to them, remarks to them on what has happened that is, is good. I'll give a little example from home start practice, actually. We sometimes use something called video interactive guidance, where we video a parent interacting with their child. We play back only the good bits, the bits where the child responded to the parent's attention. And by doing that, what we're, we're showing that parent is that they can do a good job. They are doing a good job, but maybe not all the time. Younger people, children respond to that just as much. And so when we talked about school and what can happen in school, the notion of the trauma-informed teacher, the teacher who understands that the relationship matters. So it isn't just about, you know, um, there's a lot of controversy over things like golden time where you reward a child by giving them extra playtime in the afternoon because children with poor behaviour are excluded from that and play is exactly what they need. So the notion that you look someone in the eyes and say how well they've done, even if their achievement is well below par for their age group, that matters. Mm. It really is simple, but it takes time and it's all about being human. Thank you. Jackie, you wanted to come up. Uh, I was just going to mention a bit of work that the SCQF did. They, I mean, they work with schools and help badge and level courses that are non-accredited, but they also work with employers to help level jobs. So you can um, put an SCQF level at a, a type of employment, so that might help an employer see out with a kind of um, accreditation framework. Um, and they also work with trade unions to help the trade unions negotiate around um, fair, fair employment issues as well. So there's those kind of approaches. Thank you. OK. Martin, sorry, you wanted to come in as well. Yeah, just very briefly, I just wanted to echo what Sheila said there about the importance of relationship-based support and how important that is for many of the children, the families and, uh, and the young people that we work with. Um, we know that poverty often doesn't just represent financial poverty, but poverty of... of opportunity and skills, but offer often poverty of encouragement from anybody, any close individual in, uh, that they might have in their life. So where that support and encouragement comes from a teacher um, or somebody else that they might have a really important relationship with, then that's absolutely key. Um, recognising their achievements, recognising when they've done uh, something well, um, uh, recognising any successes. But I think also there is definitely a, a, an opportunity to think about how we can better recognise what some of those achievements are, um, either 
um, were formal or, 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 or non-formal. Um, there are a number of awards that many of our own young people um, work towards, be they um, salt Tower Awards or Youth Achievement Awards and all these other. And we've even developed, um, in partnership with the Scottish Mentoring Network, uh, a couple of years ago we developed a kind of bespoke award for mentoring, for supporting some of our young people to become peer mentors through the SQA. So there's opportunities to develop further opportunities, certificated um, awards that, that, that give a sense of encouragement, support and, and achievement for many of the young people we, we work with that maybe they've never actually um, had before. Okay, thank you very much. Oliver, do you want to come in here? Um, I think most of the points I was hoping to cover have, have, have moved on. Gillian. <coughs> yeah, like Oliver, quite a lot of what I'd asked has already been, um, mm. been covered, but I want to pick out some of the uh, issues around collaboration with schools that some of you have highlighted in your submissions, in particular. Um, that some of the submissions have said that you have issues around school workers with little or no respect for parents or carers or the challenging circumstances in which some families uh, live. And I think that came from the Learning Link submission. Uh, schools been wary or close to working with external agencies. That was from Youth Link. And a lack of awareness of what youth work is. And I wonder if you'd like to take the opportunity to elaborate further on, on some of your uh, experiences. First, um, yeah, but schools are, uh, can be amazing places and uh, just a recent example, we had one of our projects worked with a really enthusiastic head teacher to engage um, parents who don't normally come into the school around various uh, two different types of projects, um, but it fell down where one of the, the teachers was not on the same wavelength as the head teacher, so um, the the teacher had had a poor experience of the parents concerned because the parents had had an inappropriate behaviour in coming into school. And it was just a kind of lack of understanding, I guess, about the challenges that the, the parents face in coming to school and to being able to negotiate. Uh, some parents who've had really poor experiences of school just don't have those negotiation skills. So if their child is penalised, criticised for their behaviour, then they get angry. And so uh, the relationships break down. And I think um, uh, we've learned from that in establishing different kind of ground rules, I guess, and ensuring that everybody is, is on board um, prior to the start of a project. But even with goodwill, um, things can break down through lack of, of understanding. Um, and do you feel that, that some of your organisations can be the link between the parents that have a nervousness of coming into a school and the school them, themselves, so that you could be the facilitators yes, there? I mean, absolutely. The project I'm talking about, the parents didn't attend the school. They didn't come to uh, parent meetings. They didn't come to uh, drop the kids off. They just didn't, they didn't come to the school. So uh, it was a really good project at getting folk involved in the school who didn't normally come there. So I think there's definitely a bridge there. Um, I think parents who feel uh, so they've had poor experiences of education themselves, they're less likely to attend. But if you can actually get a good experience of education as adults, then they, they're more likely to invest in the education of their kids and more likely to try and engage um, as peers. I think the teachers learned a lot from that as well, which is really good. So it's not actually a criticism of that teacher involved because um, she'd had a a, a challenging journey with, with the children. So it was a kind of um, a learning journey all round. And I think that's where the partnership work works, rather than it just being an end of it and there being no um, communication between the school and the, and the families. There's a kind of ongoing attempt to build relationships there. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think definitely external agencies who can, who can do um, school-based work, perhaps out with the school environment as well, can act as a very good bridge. The, obviously, the, you've flagged some questions there. I think there, there is a challenge, and it's maybe um, some of the points I, I've already, already made around the recognition of youth work as part of the family of community learning development as a professional practice, with a code of ethics, with professional competencies, with um, a value base, with its own clear purpose and outcomes. And, and there's just not been space and time enough, enough, you know, that it's, it's, it's starting to develop of understanding those professional role that youth work can, can play. And there's challenges of, um, um, Tavish Scott earlier said about youth works being in schools. It's really difficult when there's that bell ringing every 55 minutes. That's not how youth work works. Youth work is about a relationship. It's about the time that the young person needs. It's about being in a place that the young person wants to be. So there needs to be recognition that 
youth work as professionals can deliver learning experiences in a whole range of contexts, yes, within schools, but also within the wider community, at evenings, at weekends, during holidays. It's not a, it's not a service that can, that can always or should be aligned to a school. It's about al aligning to the needs of learners. And um, there was, uh, again, in, in the YouthLink submission, about lack of awareness of what youth work is. Do you think that given that the PEF funding, a lot of the schools are, are dipping their toe into engaging with, with outside organisations because they've got this funding, means that this is going to become, there's going to be an incremental change and a, more, a, a deeper understanding of the value of youth work? Is, is, is that, that funding is there? Yeah. I think we, we find, and we hear from our members, that when somebody gets it, when a school leader gets the value, and what a youth worker does through having a positive experience, they will want more of it. But what we're trying to, to find is those people who are, we, we've got all the early adopters, we're on that curve, we're trying to get everybody else onto that page that youth work is a good thing. Um, and, and knowing that, that the outcomes of youth work are, are there, but it's not necessarily about having a programme, it's about creating an experience, a learning opportunity negotiated with the young person. Um, and being okay that not knowing what um, specific outcomes or changes might happen and being brave to take those risks and think in the informal session earlier we talked about being risk averse and so it's not about saying if you do a b will happen it is about saying well actually if you leave this young person where they are probably nothing positive is going to happen we take a chance let's involve them with a youth work agency a youth work or youth work practitioner something good will likely to happen through that negotiation, through that um, recognition of the young person and the practitioner as partners in the learning journey mm -hmm. um, and, and, and seeing what, what route that will take. And we, uh, we had an informal session with some youth workers a couple of weeks ago and one of the issues that they brought up was um, how youth work could be the key to getting school refusers some kind of positive educational experience and maybe even again providing a bridge for them to re-engage with schools has that been your experience yeah absolutely and um, also the, the CLT practitioners you spoke to will, will come from within our membership and I, and I think one of the comments that was made in that in the submissions that was in the paper was about the, this is not about rewarding young people you know perceived to be bad young people with good experience this is about saying to these young people we need to invest in these young people. We need to give them good, positive experiences in order to help them learn. But we have to do it without stigma. We can't have the base for the young people who don't want to be at school. We have to do this in a way that's free from stigma, that is inclusive, and that values young people as individuals, as contributors, as something to give, um, not just um, young people to receive. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Kezia. Thanks, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I've got a particular interest in the experiences of looked after young people. I'm looking at you, Martin, in particular, but I'm sure all the panellists will have something to say about that. I appreciate time is short, but I'm looking for comments really on um, the impact of multiple placements on, on looked after young people in terms of their ability to achieve at school, being taken out of the classroom to attend children's hearings and children's panels and the relationship that has um, with their continued attainment. And also, um, if you don't mind, maybe something about how those experiences become even more challenging um, when a young person hits 16 but wants to stay within the education system, the additional challenges that they face uh, at that point? Uh, I'll start then, shall I? Um, it, certainly, I think we, we know the statistics and the outcomes in relation to education for, for that particular population of young people for, for looked after children. Um, we have a, a dedicated educational um, hub, uh, a nurture hub, um, attached to some of our cluster of, of, of residential uh, children's homes um, over in, in Fife um, and they do some excellent work for children who are otherwise because of their circumstances because of their experiences of early trauma often and, 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 and the impact that continues to have um, they are, are helping them to, to achieve in a wider sense some of the things we've talked about already this morning in relation to, um, to, to wider achievement um, is exactly some of the work that we do with that particular group of, of, of young people that we work with um, those looked after and care experienced young people 
Um, I think in relation to your point about the, the multiple placement breakdowns or multiple moves in terms of fostering placements and what have you, or we move from fostering to residential, um, there, is a, 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 there is no doubt whatsoever that that will have a fundamental impact on their, their, their well-being, their development, and ultimately how they're able to, to achieve and attain. If you don't mind me interrupting, I guess the point of this inquiry is, is around the theme of collaboration. So mm -hmm. we've identified the problem. What's the solution? How, how, how can we make sure that you know, we, we break a cycle of where kids are pulled out of class to go to a hearing and that impacts on their attainment because computer says this meeting needs to take place now? <laughs> That's uh, a really, really difficult question to, to answer. Um, we, we clearly need to, to look at the way we, the, the, the entire system uh, is provided uh, and supported. Um, what you say is true, um, actually, not just in relation to um, that particular group of children in terms of children's hearing systems and um, you know, the prescribed appointments that they need to attend and what have you. We also find it similar for children who are um, you know, referred through, through CAMS in relation to, to yeah. mental health concerns, having to be pulled out of school to attend clinical appointments you know, out of school, uh, during school hours and missing essential um, or uh, points and times at school that they might otherwise enjoy and, and the stigma that goes along with that. So they're, they're, they're both kind of similar in terms of the stigma that that, 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 um, that, that young people um, in those circumstances end up feeling. Um, yeah, I, the, there is there needs to be some collaborative approach to how we, 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 we do that better. I can't give you the answer to that just now. I would love to be able to. It's a really complex and difficult uh, area. Maybe it's something the care review um, will be able to, to, to identify and address. Sheila? I just, I'm, it's not my area of professional expertise, but I am an adoptive parent. And I have to say, I do not understand, given the school day is relatively short, why a lot of this stuff couldn't start yeah. in the afternoon. And actually, as someone who's been interested in volunteering for a children's panel, um, it would be a hell of a lot easier for someone like me to do that if the timing was shifted somewhat. That may sound like a stupid and basic comment, but I genuinely think it could be possible to stop that disruption. My, my children had meetings to attend. One of them was at primary school in the moved in um, it was difficult and it created that element of they didn't want to be marked out as different and I, I really think there must be some practical solution on timing just, on this just for the sake of clarity and for the official report are you therefore saying that if we were to change that we could improve the attainment or the achievement of looked after young people we, we know very clearly at Home Start that young people, children who already feel marked out as different and perhaps expected to fail usually fulfil that to some degree yeah. unless some interventions are made. So all I would observe from our practice and my personal experience is that the more that a child feels included along with the rest, the less that they carry around some sense of stigma and shame, the better they're likely to do. Martin, on that specific point, I'm trying to get it on the record. Yeah, if we well, the system, I, I would just like to point, maybe, um, point to an example of some of the work that we are doing up in the Highlands right now. We are, um, have, over the last couple of years, been uh, developing a, a pilot um, service that's, in, um, that's working with families uh, and their children who have been identified as at risk of being accommodated, um, who are looked after at home but at risk of being moved out of authority, um, where social work capacity um, and you know, the traditional approach to supporting those families has, has ultimately not always produced the best outcomes and, and children have ended up moving, moving uh, into residential or fostering accommodation. We have developed a model up there where we are working um, with the whole family and much of, kind of what we talked about this morning in relation to family support, working on a needs-led basis, individual work with the children, individual work with the families, but working with the families together as well. At times, and this is crucial, at times um, and in places that suit them and suit their needs, out of hours, at weekends, when the family are comfortable, when the family need that support, not Monday to Friday, nine to five. And we're already seeing in a relatively short space of time from that bit of work we're doing up there, a significant impact in terms of the number of children who are now not being accommodated or would have been moved out of authority. In fact, it's not only on our own evidence, but the authority have come back to us and said, we recognise that this X number of children would have been moved out of authority as a, unless they had received the support that you've provided them with. So, so changing our approach in that sense to that group of, of children and those families has had a fundamental impact on whether or not those children will end up in the care system or in residential or fostering care. And are you measuring the impact on their, their school achievement at the same time as well, their wider life goals? It inevitably, it will have an impact because they're not then being moved out of the community, they're not being moved away from their school and they're being able to be supported to continue. Um, there, there has not been a, a, an empirical study done into the impact of, on their education per se, but the benefits of them just remaining at home, remaining with their family, remaining in the community, remaining in their own school where they have relationships, friendships, that is, that is clear um, and beneficial to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the first panel of witnesses. Can I thank you all very much for your attendance today?
I shall suspend for a moment or two to allow the witnesses to change over before continuing. Thank you. The second panel today is focusing on the role of local authorities and can I welcome to this meeting Linda Lees, Lifelong Learning Strategic Manager, City of Edinburgh Council, John Butcher, Executive Director of Education and Youth Employment, North Ayrshire Council, and Dr James Foley, Performance Analyst, Youth and Communities, North Lanarkshire Council. If you'd like to respond to a question, please indicate to me or the clerks and I will call you to speak. There's no need to touch the consoles and there's no need to feel that you have to answer every question if you don't think it's relevant to you. Again, I should reiterate that we've got a lot to get through today, so I ask that both questions and answers be succinct. Um, so, Richard, would you like to start Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for coming to give evidence today. Uh, clearly, our inquiry is looking at the impact of poverty on the ability to learn. And I really want to turn to Dr. James Foley in the first instance, but welcome any other contributions in connection with holiday hunger, because I very much welcome the new focus, additional focus on holiday hunger. Yeah. And we've also had a good written submission from um, Lindsay Graham, who's a 
an expert in food education and has been. She's doing done a lot some great work. work, yes. Pardon? Sorry, she, I said she's done some brilliant work, yes, Lindsay. Sorry. <laughs> Lindsay has done some brilliant work. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry. Apologies. I couldn't hear you through the microphone there. Uh, <clears throat> Highlighting how important this is as an issue, and North Lanarkshire Council clearly are doing a lot of good work on holiday hunger. So I very much welcome the announcement you've been making about dedicating a lot more resources towards this. Can you speak to us about uh, why you're doing that as a council, uh, the trends in food poverty that you're experiencing as a council, the causes of that, and also how you think we should now tackle that as a country? Yeah, I mean, what we started with was a lot of anecdotal accounts. When the topic of poverty is raised, usually the first thing that people who work in deprived communities raise with me is the topic of the growing incidence of hunger being a problem. Um, especially like head teachers, teaching professionals across the board raise this every time we uh, bring up the issue. They thought it was having a significant impact on the ability to learn of their pupils. Um, the specific project for Club 365 came about in response to a conversation with our assistant chief, chief executive and one of the head teachers in one of our most deprived communities. And she was being asked, well, what would actually make a difference? And she said, I think partly in jest, that the best thing would be if we could run a boarding school during the holidays. And everyone kind of knew what she meant by that because essentially what it meant was People were coming back from the holidays uh, with a significantly deteriorated ability to learn and it would take several weeks to get them up to speed um, and back learning properly again. There's a lot of evidence that's come out in the past about learning loss, particularly um, in America, I have to say, where they have that extra long summer holidays, where our summer holidays are slightly shorter and therefore there's that difference. But uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that um, not just that there is learning loss during the holidays, but that learning loss is uh, disproportionate amongst those on the lowest incomes. Obviously, you've got the rise in incidence of food banks. You've got growing awareness of food poverty as an issue. And unfortunately, I think what you've got is a tendency where lots of anecdotal evidence starts to come out and then you start getting evidence such as the number of people attending food banks, you get polling evidence and so on. I come from an academic background myself as, as indicated and academic turnaround times are quite uh, long in the sense that sometimes a, a problem is identified and it's four years down the line until we've got the proper academic evidence about the causal links. So when it comes to food poverty, what I know is there are, I believe, according to Lindsay, say eight uh, PhDs uh, underway about the impact of learning loss and so on uh, during the holidays in the UK. Um, there are six research projects underway as well, uh, but we are we're still, uh, still very much at its infancy. And our pilot project and our plans to extend it is also a research project in the sense that we are trying to do a bit of action research and find out how effective this can be. Yeah. Your submission says that North Lanarkshire claimants will lose roughly £78 million pounds per year per year, due to post-2015 welfare reforms. Uh, that's a phenomenal amount of money for one local authority area. And is that a driver in terms of your concerns about ongoing child poverty and the need to focus on holiday hunger issues? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are about to get um, universal credit rolled out um, in our area. It's a, I know it's a big anxiety for our financial inclusion team. Um, we've had... This is my, part of my point about the recentness of a lot of this sorts of stuff. The EIS survey that was done on it was suggesting that a lot of these problems have intensified in recent years. I did a survey amongst, I, I was speaking to 50 teachers in our local authority yesterday, and I said, hands up who thinks that the problem of hunger has intensified since 2015. And they all put their hand up. So this is something that has been widely recognized. As I said, we need more research on it. Um, we need more research to validate the link between uh, learning loss, hunger, and attainment in the end. Um, and we are working with academic partners on that. But as a matter of the fact that food to me should be a fundamental human right, I think it's something that we need to do. Okay, thank you. My final question, maybe we can bring in 
other witnesses as well, is in addressing holiday hunger, which I think absolutely must be a, a big priority now for uh, the Scottish Government, certainly, but also the UK Government, who are responsible for the poverty in the first place that are causing the rise in child poverty. Um, we have schools which remain closed for a large part of the year when, you know, they're on holiday. And one of the themes is that we should open up the schools and you used America uh, in terms of what they're doing as an example, maybe to follow. Uh, clearly, our schools have a huge burden and lots of responsibilities as things stand at the moment. And to add in tackling food poverty and opening up and serving meals, which sounds a very laudable thing to do, clearly that would be an additional burden in itself. How do we involve the rest of the community to deliver that service? Uh, you know, and what's your way forward in terms of getting the resources to deal with this issue? Because it seems to me that because the UK government's policies are causing poverty, there's more pressure on the Scottish government's budget to deal with the fallout issues uh, and pick up the pieces. And this just loads on more and more pressure onto local government I'll budgets. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I mean, I absolutely value the project that's, that's going on in my colleagues' um, authority in North Lanarkshire. They're not the only authority, however, who are tackling this issue. In my own authority in North Ayrshire, we've had um, tackling food poverty um, for a number of years now. And it's a very targeted response in our authority because we've got targeted communities that require it. Food poverty is, is crucial. We don't want children going to school who have not had a breakfast, who, um, for example, and who may not eat from a Friday till a Monday uh, having a proper meal, because that clearly impacts on their ability to learn. But it's not just about food poverty for, for the, the initiatives that we run. It's about social isolation. It's about learning while uh, those holiday breaks are on. And it's also about involving parents um, in there. So it's a targeted community response. And in terms of your, your point about schools um, opening, I but firmly believe schools are absolutely rooted and should be rooted at the centre of their communities. They are a community resource. You know, they are arguably an underused community resource. And therefore, we need to open our schools at all times for a whole variety of things. Um, and it is important that our teachers get involved in that because quite a number of them do in my own authority. They come out during holidays, they come out during breaks, and they are involved in those. But it's also about encouraging um, people who live in those communities to contribute to their children's learning, to get involved as part of a family learning initiative um, when these um, holiday clubs or food clubs are on the go. And I think that's really important as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that's already been said. We in Edinburgh are in an interesting position right now because we are developing our first um, projects to look at holiday hunger. We won't be calling it that um, because actually thinking about the children and the young people and the families, they don't want to go to something that's called holiday hunger. So we are looking at that. We're thinking about calling it Discover so that we are in encouraging young people to discover new activities, to discover learning to cook together, to discover family learning, to discover their own communities and to discover trips. So it's very much a partnership approach that we're taking. Now, we haven't started yet, but a lot of the learning that's already um, being gleaned from other local authorities is very important for us. I would absolutely echo that the importance of involving the community, the third sector, parents, teachers, but also PSAs, because often PSAs know the children very intimately and they live locally. So it's quite important that we, we have that very hybrid mix of people involved. The other thing is that we're not looking just at a summer holiday. The Christmas holiday is a really important holiday where children often go back to school very distressed and hungry. Um, for a number of reasons. So we're looking at using and adopting the improvement methodology to start in October. Well, we'll do a summer holiday programme this year. We'll evaluate it, learn from it, and start with each next holiday so that by the time we come to the longer next summer holiday, we hope that we will have something that's really engaged with a lot of partners, a lot of our own staff, because we have very experienced staff who also, like the third sector organisation, know these families, know these communities extremely well. So it's, it's a, a very interesting point for us at the moment because we're about to start and we definitely want to be looking out to other local authorities to learn what they've been doing as well. I would completely echo all of those comments about the fact that we can't do it alone as local authorities. We're looking to work in partnership with other groups as well. It's something that we're going to be investigating for the future. Uh, the first thing we want to be able to do is maximise our own use of resources. 
The only sort of caveat we'd put to this is that if we take Finland as being the model of an, of an education system that many people around the table would like to look to, they were able to roll out their free school meals in the post-war situation when Finland was not a particularly rich country. And then may have, maybe, therefore, this is a question of longer-term investment. We need a political consensus for that investment, um, and that might be something that's worth considering. Right. Thank you. Ruth? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I should probably um, declare an interest. I was a North Ayrshire councillor between 2012 and 2016. Um, in our first evidence session, um, Daniel Mason said that 10% of schools in England have managed to narrow the gap. Um, when I asked her um, how they did that, which was the obvious question, <laughs> um, she spoke about the focus on what goes on in the classroom. Now, obviously, reducing, alleviating, eliminating poverty outside and all this, I'm not minimising any of, any of that work at all, but I just wonder with a specific focus on what goes on in the classroom, whether you can speak to um, steps that your local authorities are taking. In that same evidence session, um, Jim McCormack said that North Ayrshire was bucking the trend. Um, in terms of SIMD and, and performance of young people. So I wonder if Mr Butcher would talk to us about the Professional Learning Academy, which seems to be um, one of the differences in that authority. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, North Ayrshire is um, unfortunately the second highest level of child poverty in Scotland behind Glasgow. I used to work in Glasgow as head of education there, so I have experience of, of the two highest levels of, of deprivation for ch and child poverty in Scotland. I, I, I firmly believe in partnership, um, and let me you know, not discount some of the evidence you've just heard, because um, it's really important, and I want to come back to some of that later if I can, particularly around about the police involvement, um, if I can later. Um, but I do firmly believe that, that our future is based in, in our children's learning. Um, because our teachers are our most valuable resource, our support staff in our schools are our most valuable resource, and everybody that interacts with those uh, young people is our most valuable resource, and therefore we should be investing in them for the future. Um, one of the things that we, we, we've done in, in North Ayrshire is we set up the Professional Learning Academy. And the Professional Learning Academy um, has our um, most qualified, best teachers, best staff there working um, that are drawn for a number of a um, agencies, not just teachers, but also um, speech and language therapists, early years workers and psychologists. And their prime function is to increase the capacity of our schools um, to um, work with our teachers on um, literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing um, strategies in the, in the best way that they possibly can to um, get across what works. And the difference between going for training at the Professional Learning Academy um, and to training that I used to go to as a young teacher um, or you may have experienced is that there was very of, often very little follow-up to that. So you went to something, you learned something, and you may or may not have implemented it. The Professional Learning Academy follows that up. So if you go for training and you go for staff development, you then are followed that up with coaching and mentoring so that it, you implement the practice that you have learned in your class. And that's a key plank of our attainment challenge uh, work. It's not the only plank, because we've got nurture, we've got um, working in relation to data analysis, to leadership, and to family learning, as well as schools counselling initiatives. And also rooted in, the, in that is working with uh, partners from a range of agencies. So what, what difference has that made? Huge difference. Um, with 50, over 50% 50 of our learners in SIMD 1 to 3, um, we have a significant challenge there. We have evidence that we are closing that attainment gap without bringing the top down, which is equally as important, because the easiest way to bring the attainment gap down was to forget about your top learners or your high achievers. Well, we're doing both because we're working with the University of Glasgow in relation to our uh, high achieving learners and indeed I spoke at that conference last week. But we are, our targeted approaches have made a significant impact and I'll maybe give you some of um, the figures. We've in, um, closed the gap in primary literacy by, by 5.3%, in secondary literacy by 16.2%, um, and in um, bet 14 one, 0.1% between SIMD 1 and 2 and those in SIMD 
three and four. Numeracy has improved by 2% in terms of closing that gap between SIMD 1 and 3 and 4. Um, in terms of, you've talked about soft analysis earlier on in terms of things that are difficult to measure. We have a nurture initiative as the, we brought from Glasgow, which had a significant investment in nurture. We've seen a 73% improvement in the developmental strand and a 75% improvement in the diagnostic stand, um, strand. And of course, we don't forget early years because we've seen a 5% um, improvement in individual um, learning for children in the early years in terms of their developmental milestones. So significant improvement. Aye, Sorry, you, can, you could always send us those figures. Uh, yeah, I can. Aye. I've got those. Thank you for that full answer. Um, I'd be interested to hear from, from the other panel members what specific classroom interventions to support teachers um, are happening in your local authorities and how you measure their successes. Okay. Um, I'm not a quality improvement officer, so I don't have the absolute detail of a lot of the support and challenge work that is going on with our schools. But what we are doing at the moment is definitely taking a real focus on quality of learning and teaching and putting in place a suite of frameworks to support head teachers and their teachers to improve quality of learning and teaching for all learners. So the first framework that's actually just been um, launched to schools is the framework for equity. And one of the things that's not happened yet, but we'll be asking schools to do, is actually really understand their own school's equity profile and set authority and school stretch aims. So there'll be professional learning and support and challenge going along with that for schools. So that's, that's something that I can Something coming up you. in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was brought in specifically to deal with the poverty related uh, issues uh, in relation to the classroom and so on. Um, so I'm kind of coming at it from the opposite angle of what you were talking about it, if you see what I mean, because we already have a large suite of interventions around the classroom that were in place and I was brought in specifically to look at what can we do about the rest of the social environment when it comes to the attainment challenge. Um, at one presentation I was at recently, I heard an estimate saying that um, in terms of the attainment gap, 15% is to do with things that happen inside the classroom and 85% is to do with other issues, if you know what I mean, other sociological issues. And therefore, that was why I was brought in. Now, I can get for you the detail, if you would like, uh, in relation to what we are doing and what impact it's having. I'm sure it's available. Unfortunately, I'm just not particularly qualified to answer the question, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. Chair, sure. just to be clear, both of those things are really important. Um, I think it would be interesting to receive that by the letter, if you could. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, Tamish? Um, thank you very much, Karina. Can I ask, can I ask all of you, but particularly, I guess, someone who's a performance analyst, um, can you give me three examples of how you measure achievement? <laughs> um, because we had a debate earlier on, in the, and I don't know if you were in earlier on, but um, as a committee, we're very interested in, in, uh, in how we do that, given that's one of the chief, biggest challenges in education policy. Do you measure it, and if so, how? Um, I uh, unfortunately I've only been in my job currently for a week, uh, right. so it's okay, not well. it's not someone I'm particularly. Okay, how about, how about, um, I'm, I'm still dealing others. with the club three six five and so on uh, right at this minute. Do you plan um, to? I know it? what we are trying to do is we are trying to incorporate more qualitative analysis into what we are doing in terms of measurement. Um, we are going to be doing more using the benchmarking tools in order to try and improve our performance. Unfortunately, I don't have a detail on that, but I'm happy to get it to you. That'd be great, yes. I wonder if the two councils would have any measurements. The, 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 the real answer to that is we have a whole suite of, me, of yeah, ways give me that three. we gather. I don't want a whole I'll give suite. You, okay, I'll three. give you three. Um, Outdoor education, you, you, we talked about, you heard the importance of outdoor education. We measure that we, all of our primary sevens, for example, we, have a, we are one of the authorities that are lucky to have an outdoor education resource on the island of Arran. Everybody gets an outdoor education experience, plus a certification for, for, for being part of that, and that's fully recognised. It's really valued by those children, parents, whatever else. We measure the number of children, for example, who do Duke of Edinburgh's mm -hmm. awards. We also measure the number of ch children, for example, who are in involved with the Outdoor Education Trust. Um, we pick up on examples in, in relation to a whole suite of um, John Muir Awards, for example, that would t take that, or external college courses that happen um, in that, or in community involvement. 
that recognises a whole, whole range of, of so, wider achievements so for children. So would you be able to give the committee just some detail on that in writing afterwards, possibly? Yeah, we can gather some of that Specifically on how you measure achievement. Yeah, yeah. If that, thank you. What does, what does Edinburgh do? Um, well, there's always this question about whether we value what we already measure or we actually measure what we value. And I think we maybe need to shift some of the dialogue around starting to measure what we value and think about what we value. So achievement, there is some measurement around accredited awards, youth achievement mm -hmm. awards and things like that. But I think we do need to be considering wider achievement slightly differently and consider, well, outdoor learning is certainly one. There are accredited awards through that, but again, the actual individual achievement that young people might feel and experience and be able to draw upon is not, I don't think, talked about quite enough mm -hmm. um, across the sectors. I'd also suggest that learning instrumental music, um, there's a whole poverty issue around that as well, in terms of some authorities charging and others not. Yeah. But the achievements that you see when young people stand up and play an instrument, learn an instrument, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, they can, the, the, that can be measured certainly through SQA and RSAMD qualifications. But actually, there's something about achievement when you're just standing up and playing an instrument mm. in front of mm. your peers sure. and the positive feedback that you get from that. So I think it's an area that actually needs a lot of debate. Uh, but I, well, totally. But if I get your job title right, uh, Ms. Lees, you're the, you're the lifelong learning strategic manager. So as part of your job to come up with a better way to, to give your elected members, I suppose, ultimately, um, authoritative advice about how all these informal education and other measures are working to, achieve, to deliver achievement? Yes, and um, recently I've been quite involved with CLD. I, my job has changed fairly recently, and I've been quite involved with CLD looking at the inspection, and one of the things that we are recognising that we've maybe not done as well, and are definitely looking to improve on, is how we do measure wider achievement, but not only within our lifelong learning service, but how that is shared with schools, and also how some of what's captured within schools is shared because I think there are certainly situations that we've noticed where young people are doing achievement awards that are out of school and not captured within school. So at the moment, a lot of the measuring is captured through school and we need to improve that dialogue between the learning that takes place out of school and in school. So that's something we're working okay. on. Okay, thank you very much. Davish Ross. Thanks. I'd like to um, come back to the cost of the school day and fair numerous examples of the impact of not just the obvious costs like um, uniform blazers, braiding, appropriate footwear, PE kit, um, but smaller costs that are still problematic, non-uniform days we have to bring a collection, etc. I'm interested from the local authorities' perspective about where the decisions are ultimately made on this. There's mention in the papers around uh, guidance that's given to, to head teachers, and I'd be looking for a bit of information from yourself about uh, where the balance is, who, who ultimately makes the decision, what's the difference between a local authority instructing schools to make sure that they're poverty-proofed in this way and where they're giving appropriate guidance to head teachers with the intention that head teachers will, of their own volition, implement it? I'll, I'll, yeah. Yeah. The, the one I, I start with you? One of raising awareness of child poverty. This is a project that launched really in 2015 and used a lot of evidence and research to think about how it was that we could set up focus groups, training, train the trainers and provide um, support and guidance really for schools. So we've got a number of publications that have been launched, first of which was Top Tips for Schools. It's not just thinking about swap shops and things like that for um, for, for pupils, it's thinking about how to use the language slightly differently so that you're not, through the best will, coming up with the wrong type of language that actually does that stigmatisation anyway. So about, I don't have the exact figures, but quite a number of our secondary schools and a number of our primary schools have actually been involved in training. Many teachers and third sector partners across the city have been involved in conferences. We've trained a number of trained the trainers and I think it's about 19 schools, high schools and about 57 primary schools have actually got a named person within their school who is responsible for um, raising child's awareness of child poverty within the schools and within the staff. So these um, publications, um, top tips for schools, also um, making education equal for all. There's another one in five publication that's gone out to schools. We're linking these in with um, 
other planning, like children's services plan and things. So we're making sure that our schools understand the kind of language to use, as well as lots of ideas about what they can do to help reduce the cost of school day. And just before others uh, come in, sorry, just to follow up on that, are you finding that, that that guidance and that support, that it's being consistently implemented within the schools that you're working with? Or is, there, is there a level of inconsistency between the, the 19 and 57 that you mentioned, or within them? I'm not the person who's actually directly involved in delivering the training. It is being evaluated. I would say it is being well used. Um, anecdotally, there is very, very good feedback, and there definitely are some statistics, which I don't have in front of me at the moment, but could be shared. Yeah, if you could share that would be great. Yeah, I, th I thought Linda's paper on this was excellent and we did give some uh, good guidance on it. It's something that we're looking at. We've got an officer member working group within the council that deals specifically with poverty proof and, and the cost of the school day. Uh, it involves the trade unions, um, councillors and officers like myself. Um, and it's, it's out of that that several of our initiatives have been launched. Um, we took an early decision that we were going to deal with period poverty uh, before it was in the programme for government. Um, obviously, we had Club 365. We've had a number of other uh, initiatives as well on a smaller scale. Um, what we are looking to do is to launch uh, some training in conjunction with the Child Poverty Action Group because they're about to bring out a toolkit uh, for dealing with this that's going to involve teachers, pupils and parents in thinking these things through. We did a survey, th I think it was us and EIS together did a survey based on their document. Um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Um, but uh, what we found with that was there was a lot of evidence of good practice already ongoing in the schools. Some great things were going on. One thing I, I think of off the top of my head was in terms of reducing the stigma, one school, instead of having second hand uniform sorts of things that could be quite stigmatising, had rebranded it as a sort of green, uh, eco-friendly type initiative, you know, and it's just small scale things like that that we started to pick up. And we, what we know about that is, I mean, North Lanarkshire, we don't need to say, has got problems of deprivation kind of across the board. Um, there's already teachers who have years of experience in dealing with these things, and some people deal with it tremendously well, but they're dealing with it on an ad hoc basis. So what we are trying to generate with our process is to get all these good examples, uh, these examples of good practice, and generalise them across the board. There's a lot of people uncertain about a lot of issues because they are dealing with the problems every day. But if you're, if you think someone is suffering from hunger, do you want? necessarily to be referring them to a food bank or a social worker or anything like that it's a very sensitive thing because clearly some people take an implication from it that you're not able to look after your children or whatever it is and therefore we need guidance in terms of teaching the teachers who might be less experienced with these issues how to deal with it and that's going to be partly bringing in people like child poverty action group but as i said it's also about we already know it, we just don't know that we know it. You know what I mean? There's things happening that are good and we just want to get those across to people as much as possible. Okay, thank you. To answer Mr Greer's original question, I suppose the, the issue is, um, unfortunately in my authority, it's, it's poverty is an everyday part of life. And uh, I don't necessarily need to instruct any of my head teachers to be able to be sympathetic to the, the, the poverty that exists in their communities. They all know it, they see it every day, they touch it, they smell it, they feel it, they experience it every single day. So they are very aware of the cost of the school day um, for our children, young people, that, that goes across everything that you talked about from uniforms to attending trips and whatever else. And we try and minimise that and support that in, in every way we can. So we don't. You, we don't need to be necessarily be directive around that. However, in, in my own authority, like, like my colleagues here, we have anti-poverty strategies. We have our Fair for All strategy in North Ayrshire, which aims to um, you know, deal with the consequences of poverty for um, all North Ayrshire's residents, and it includes economic strategies. It includes um, work in relation to mental health and well-being. Um, partnership work with the, you know, with our integrated health and um, social care partners, but it in also includes work that we do with our children and young people, and that's led to the development of what is 
really an innovative children's services plan, which I would encourage you to read from North Ayrshire, which is written from the perspective of young people, and it makes a series of promises to those young people and families about what we can and can't achieve and what their expectations should be of us. And it's, a, it's an interesting way. And the issue is not just producing those documents, it's about transferring it into actions. And I think our schools and our communities are trying really hard to do that. We were the first authority to introduce our strategies to tackle period poverty. All of our schools have free sanitary products in our secondary schools, and we were the first to do that, including our PPP schools. So um, really, we are working hard to, to do that. Thank you. One that you wanted to come back on. Just very quickly, um, one of our clusters, certainly across the city, a number of teachers were reflecting that they did not necessarily know what information to pass on to parents when they were asking about poverty. And so a document has been created about the financial support and information that's been given into every school and they can just be handing that out to parents about where to go. But one of our clusters, we put a welfare officer into the cluster and they have been giving appointments to families within all the schools in that cluster. And through that income, income, sorry, income maximisation, that cluster, the 47 families that have actually been involved in accessing these appointments have maximised their income to the tune of around 150,000 for the families. So that's an important piece of information for schools that's having an impact. Thank you very much. Very briefly, please. Uh, just to say that there is a role for other services like uh, the financial inclusion uh, side of things in our council. We've done some great work in terms of reducing the number of food bank referrals, which they managed to cut substantially in the space of a couple of years, just by making it the first port of call that when someone is being referred, that they should try to maximise their income first by making them aware of the benefits they're entitled to rather than being referred to food banks. There is a danger that food banks do become a permanent part of our welfare state, and I think it's something that a lot of people would like to avoid. Julian, you wanted to come in before? Yeah, I'm very interested in what Fully just said about how North Atlantic should have tackled period poverty, and he maybe knows that I've been campaigning on this ever since I've been elected. In my area of Aberdeenshire, um, the, we have hidden poverty and stigmatisation is something that you mentioned and that you've all mentioned that you know, teachers and schools and local authorities are keenly aware of it. In my area, it's, it's harder to recognise. How important is it that in issues around like period poverty and the provision of, of uh, products around that, that, that young girls don't have to put themselves out there and ask for it, that it's freely available. And I know that's something that you prioritise. I mean, it's, it's a double stigma that we're dealing with here in relation to the fact that there's all the stigma around poverty that we know already exists, um, but also that you've got the taboo subject of women's reproductive health, um, which is a major problem as well. Um, for us, we want to introduce this, not just that the products are going to arrive, but that we are going to be introducing education uh, for the schools, for teachers, uh, for parents and everyone else in relation to the fact that this is normal. This is not something that should be seen as a problem or unsanitary or whatever it happens to be. Um, so we want to change attitudes and values with the policy as well as just providing this for the very extreme examples. I mean, obviously, there's the extreme examples, like you've probably seen the film I, Daniel Blake, with that terrible uh, mm. uh, case that was in that, which was based on real incidences mm -hmm. that had been reported. But in, in, in Lanarkshire, North Lanarkshire schools, you have got these products yes. in the bathrooms available. They don't have to go and ask a teacher uh -huh. or a nurse. 100%. For those um, and you, have you had any problems at all with people misusing that service? Well, we, I, when, I, when I said uh, what we, we are introducing this uh, service um, in the beginning of June, um, and yes, the instruction is going to be that these are freely available in baskets. Um, we considered other delivery models, such as the free vending machines and so on. Eventually, we did decide that baskets would be the least stigmatising option, particularly for uh, people who might be transgender or whatever. We wanted to keep these things as open as we possibly could. Um, and yes, we, want, um, we do not want to have a situation where people have to go and ask for the products 100%. Uh, very briefly, please, John. Ms Martin, we, we, we already have these in all of our schools, in all of our secondary schools. We um, um, have had them for a, about eight months now, 
and we, uh, to answer your initial question, we saw some misuse of them in, the, in about the first week. We went through a significant amount of sanitary products when they, for about the first week or two, and then that settled down, and right. there was a novelty value in that, as all children explore things. We use vending machines, and the vending machines are, are free for use. Um, and they have a, a, a range of sanitary products. As I've said, they are they're, they're non-stigmatising. They're in the toilets. People go and get them when they want them. Um, and it's been a, a, a terrific success in our schools, and I would encourage other local authorities to do exactly the same thing. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wanted to ask about um, PEF funding. Um, throughout our evidence sessions, we've heard some um, evidence on different uses of PEF funding, from buying supplies for school to this morning's example of purchasing um, p police officers to patrol the, the, the campus, which is not something, that obviously, we would want to um, encourage in, in any way. Um, we also heard this morning that um, PEF funding could potentially be used in a more innovative way, working with other educators and, and the third sector to, to help to raise the kind of wider, wider learning and to help to raise attainment. Is there any evidence across your local authorities um, that, that that is happening? Do you encourage that, that kind of more innovative use of PEF, PEF across your local authorities? And if you do, could you give us an example of where it's worked? I'll, I'll pick up on that first of all. Can I first of all turn to the, to the issue of campus officers, because we've, we've heard quite a bit about that this morning, and, and, and I would be the first to say that I think uh, my colleague uh, earlier in the evidence session probably was referring to my own authority. And we have campus officers in some of our schools, and I want to clear uh, up some of the... But was the campus officers, but was PEF funding used to provide some, those that, that, some of the pe Some of those schools chose to use part of their PEF funding to, to purchase some campus officers. The rest is funded by Police Scotland. That is their choice. Um, now, you, you, we talked about, we heard a lot of evidence from the third sector about breaking down um, and encouraging partnerships. One of the key partnerships is encouraging it with Police Scotland and breaking down some of the barriers between Police Scotland and local authorities can, can and children and young very people. Can I briefly interrupt you before you go on? Um, and, and perhaps in, in responding to me, you could um, perhaps make it clear how the school um, evidenced that using PEF funding to provide campus officers raised attainment, because that's what PEF funding is for. Yeah, because campus officers don't patrol schools, you know, is, is the bottom line. They don't actually wander about the schools in their uniforms. They, create, they are involved in Duke of Edinburgh's awards. Campus officers take some of those clubs. They're involved in wider achievements that um, Mr Scott um, got involved, you asked a question about earlier. They're involved fully in the life of the school. They encourage young people to be part of the school, to get into school in the morning. They work with parents to break down those barriers and, um, between police, between schools, and to encourage those parents to, to send their children to school to get that involvement. There's a long history of campus officers, both in, in Glasgow and in my own authority, and they are not there to police the schools. They are there to be absolutely a key partner in the schools. Commander Main, who's the divisional commander in Ayrshire, is working really hard to make policing in Ayrshire a trauma-informed police force. And that's about understanding adverse childhood experiences for that every police officer in Ayrshire will understand that. They'll understand the impact of those adverse childhood experiences on those children. And therefore, when their officers are working in schools with young people and with their families, they will understand the impact of those. And they will get a more, more constructive, more engaging, and more productive set of policing there, and they will gain intelligence. And I think that's a fundamental part of the importance of yeah, and, and being can, partners I, I in this initiative. I understand the breaking down barriers. I, I, I do genuinely struggle to see how having officers in a school can raise attainment. But if we could perhaps... Can, can we not just concentrate on well, one aspect of PEF? Really because what it seems is that... You know, mm -hmm. head teachers use PEF for all sorts of different uh -huh. things, and it's not and, for us to pick one that yeah. some people might not like and then right. decide to do I, I, it. Thank, sorry, convener. Um, PEF is used for a whole range of things. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the guidance allows head teachers to be innovative, and they should be innovative in how they use their PEF funding. And they can use it in any way that they choose that will help them target young people who, the, who, they re, who require to be supported to improve their attainment and achievement from 
the lower SIMD deciles. And that has included work in relation to um, wider use of, of community-based resources, your involvement of community learning and development in the work that they do, the involvement of youth workers. They've used it to buy in school counselling sessions in relation to supporting health and well-being. They bring in additional curricular resources in relation to that. So there's a whole plethora of how PEF funding is used, but it's all used appropriately by head teachers at their discretion and choice to use it for their own particular circumstances in their own communities. Okay. Could, could our other witnesses perhaps give examples where PEF has been used in an innovative way to, to raise attainment? Dr Foley, Mrs Lees. Um, there are a number of schools in Edinburgh who are using their PEF very innovatively. And I think one example that I'm sure our attainment advisor could share with this committee is um, a school out in Wester Hills where the primary head has really got to know her community, but she has also taken a very creative approach and tried to give her children that wide range of, I suppose, what you might describe as middle-class experiences, but always tied that back into learning and teaching, always tied that back into literacy, numeracy, and health and wellbeing. So the experiences that she brings into her school involve arts and cultural organisations, outdoor learning, counsellors, a whole um, range of different professionals and some of that's done through a negotiation with the local authority because again sometimes we have a quality assurance role to play in which organisations may really deliver exactly what that head teacher needs. So rather than it being a very binary thing between the schools and an outside provider there is an element of that negotiation with the local authority as well, but certainly the impact on attainment in that school in particular, I haven't got the figures, I'm sure they could be provided, but it's been a very interesting example of using PEF money well to bring about very different experiences linked directly back to learning teaching for those children. Okay. And uh, I was brought in kind of specifically to deal with the uh, cost of the school day type initiative. So a lot of the um, pay funding initiatives that are kind of fed back to me tend to be relatively small scale things on the basis of the cost of the school day type initiatives. They tend to be uh, head teachers who are buying in spare uniforms, spare um, gym kits, um, people who are running small-scale lunch or breakfast clubs um, and so on. We are currently undertaking a review, which I will be involved in, um, of our uh, best examples of best practice when it comes to PEF, um, which I'm happy to share with the committee uh, whenever that is published. Um, what I would say is I know there are anxieties about how exactly you're allowed to spend PEF, the procurement frameworks and so on and so forth that are that do exert some sort of uh, psychological pressures around this sort of thing, and that has been shared with me as well. So um, I don't know if there's anything that can be done about that, but it's something I'd kind of like to, you know, um, to share. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Just on that last point, uh, Dr Foley, the, the procurement issue has come up quite a lot over the mm -hmm. last uh, couple of weeks, and, and also in, in all the ways that you can spend your PEF. Uh, we had been told on a number of occasions uh, that, for example, you couldn't hire teachers. The fact is that you can using PEF money. Oh. We were told that um, there was obstacles with procurement and how so, sort of small small schools couldn't work together to, to buy in services. But we were told again that you can. So it seems to be that it's not the rules that are stopping us, yeah. it's the guidance from the local authorities, it's, it's, it's the feedback that we've been getting that are stopping us, and why would that be, and why would local authorities be working in different ways for us? Mr Butcher, you seem to be keen to come in. Convener, I, I, you, I, I've heard all of those, those things as well. Um, the, the, the fact is that you can get whatever teachers you want um, using PEF. Um, the difficulty for some authorities is lack of teachers. Yeah, I accept you, and you can get pupil support assistance, you can get whatever you want with PEF, and that should not be a barrier to it. There are some procurement rules around purchasing from, for example, and my third sector colleagues who were here earlier, um, procurement um, has to do that. But in my own authority, schools are clubbing together to make bids um, and that, that procurement will support. And procurement are going out of their way to actually support those bids. Sometimes that's a bit of a slow process and it's a slow burner, but they're actually getting to grips with that now. 
I think one of the fundamental issues around about PEF that, that was never considered when it was given was that if you look at the history of education, unlike, say, for example, social work, who have procured services from the third sector for years and years and years and have relationships with Aberlour, or Bernardo's and whatever else, education has no history of procurement. And there was some feeling, uh, you know, when PEF came in, suddenly all our head teachers would know how to procure. Well, that actually doesn't exist, so it, ta it will take a little bit of time to work our th way through that. But in my own authority, procurement are working hard to support our head teachers, and we have given them very little guidance except be imaginative and get what you need to think you think to close the attainment gap. It's interesting to hear. Does anybody else have any comment on that? Um, two of the things that certainly Edinburgh did at the beginning of PEF was to look at the equity, the raising attainment, the learning and teaching, and bring in speakers like Sue Ellis to talk about that. And then the other thing they did was to, to look very carefully at those issues of HR and procurement and provide guidance and support for teachers, head teachers, about those things that they were less familiar with. So those were two strands that we took in the introduction of PEF. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Uh, just very briefly, convener, we had a very interesting uh, uh, discussion in the informal session this morning about the value of breakfast clubs, um, because it was seen that the early learning evidence is very much that that's the important meal of the day for so many youngsters. Um, I'm conscious of time, convener, but would, you, would your local authorities be able to provide us with some examples of the success of breakfast clubs? Could yes. you send that in? That'd yes. Be very I mean, the short answer is yes. I mean, the, the, I think okay. it's... It's, it's what long established that, that yeah. actually getting up in the morning, getting to school, yeah. having something to eat before you're actually, yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's part of that readiness to learn. just if we can see the evidence, it would be very yeah. helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. In that case, can I thank you for your evidence this morning? And I now close the public session. Thank you very much. <laughs>